And I bid you all grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It is great to be with you this Wednesday, July the first year of our Lord, 2020. Well, we're continuing on with Haman on being a Christian, and we started chapter 5 yesterday, and here he's beginning to talk about what God's being for me now means about the future, specifically life after death. And what Haman said yesterday was that our future is completely in God's control, and that means that we can look forward to a perfected life after death, and that we recognize that some of what God has done, we already experience now. His kingdom is with us now. We have forgiveness now. We are justified in His sight now. We have Him in us now. But then there's much that is not yet. We are waiting for the fullness yet to come. And so he's going to elaborate on that waiting for the fullness. He's talked about some of the things that we wait for that are very definite about the end, that we shall be perfected, for instance. But then there's other things he says, eh, the future is a little bit more ambiguous. We're going to have to wait till we get there because really right now, anything that God might do to try and describe what that future is like will fall short because it is beyond our ability to truly understand or grasp. But we're picking up in chapter 5. What is vague about the new existence are the details and the concrete aspects of that existence. Scripture contains pictures enough of the not yet state. These pictures are all drawn from the circumstances of this life. Those occurrences and conditions and possessions that give us pleasure here in this life are transferred with some exaggeration to the time and the world that are coming. We have pictures of a beautiful, perfectly defended city, of marriage and of the wedding day, of a banquet of food and drink, of a delightful world of nature. With these pictures are joined all the negatives, the absence of those things that cause pain and sorrow and misery here in this world. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. That's Revelation chapter 7, 16 and 17. As for the body, quote, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. That's Philippians 3, 20 and 21. There's no valid basis for the idea that Christians should not add their own imaginings to these pictures. A friend of my father's imagined heaven as a place where he could spend endless pleasant hours with my father in discussion, smoking a contemplative pipe and drinking a good beer. Why not? This is valid as long as we continually realize these are only pictures and not realities, and that the realities will be far grander and more glorious than we can dream. The whole future of the not yet is tied up with the return of Jesus Christ. The Christian creeds speak of one of the purposes of Christ's return. Quote, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. That's the Apostles' Creed. Quote, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. That's the Nicene Creed. Quote, at his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, but those who have done evil will go into eternal fire. That's the Athanasian Creed. The determining question of Christ at the judgment will be, did you really believe in me or not? The judgment will reveal each person as he, she was. There will be no deception any longer, no self-deception and no deception of others. Realities will be the order of that day, not talk, not appearance. But why must Christ return in order for this to happen? Is judgment not possible in other ways? Why this particular office for Christ? Well, humankind judged Christ in the days of his flesh. The world has seen only his shame, loss, death, and destruction. Quote, your attitude should be the same of that as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of a cross. That's Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. The picture the world has seen of Christ has been paired with another, that glory and of triumph. Therefore, quote, God has exalted him to the highest place and given him that name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every name knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2 again now, verses 9 through 11. It is also certainly fitting to give another reason for this. The person through whom the whole salvation of God for our race has come, and by whom it was achieved, should also be the one to judge whether it has actually been accepted by people 
or rejected by them. Another very important thought besides that of judgment is tied to the return of Jesus Christ. The Christian needs the hope of the return of Jesus Christ and what belongs to it with all its consequences in order to continue to live by the faith that makes up the Christian's existence. Only a final judgment, an unmistakable act of God, in short, the return of Christ through whom God has from the beginning dealt with humankind, can give the demonstration that is needed to remove the ambiguity from this present life, where what is good and right does not always triumph, and where evil is not always put down. Leave faith without the hope of such a clear act of judgment, and faith would collapse. Faith is certainty and unshakable confidence indeed, but it can only be that if it's linked with the hope that God will infallibly prove the reality of those things in which faith now trusts. Well, that's a good stopping point for today. May God richly bless you throughout the rest of this day on into tomorrow, and I look forward to sharing another time of devotion tomorrow as well. Peace be with you all. God bless.